I want to become a developer. I want to get started and build. And I said, okay, great. Go buy the ragless house you can and renovate it. And look, to your point, you're going to learn so much. See, doing an old house is way more, is more difficult than building a new house. But see, here's the thing. But if you go build a house first, you're going to think that's the most hardest thing you've ever done. Versus if you do that old house first, building new is going to be easy because you got a point of reference. You got something to compare it to. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Real Estate 101 Show. I'm your host today, Patrick Donnelly. And with me today is a really special guest I'm excited to have on, Tyron McDaniel. Tyron, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Patrick. Looking forward to sharing with you for a little while here. Yeah, I am too. I've been studying you, listening to several of your podcasts, really interested in hearing more of your story. But I wanted to jump in early days, like what it was like growing up for you in Houston in the Fifth Ward. Tell us a little bit about like what it was like in your family. I know your dad was somewhat entrepreneurial. Talk to us a little bit about your, your dad, your mom and dad and growing up. No, most certainly. Yeah. So great. Uh, and it's always interesting when uh, people have done their research there. So it's pretty cool. But no, yeah, grew up in um, what we call the shadows of downtown Houston neighborhood called the Bloody Nickel, a.k.a. Fifth Ward, home of the ghetto boys. For those who maybe listen to old school rap in the 80s and 90s, well, 90s, actually. But um, grew up lower middle class is what I would call it. And I didn't, it wasn't until middle school, I realized that we were probably closer to the lower part of me than actually being middle class. But, um, but, you know, I had a pretty good childhood. I mean, I have fond memories of, of growing up where I grew up and how I grew up. My mom just, you know, took care of the kids and, you know, regular little jobs. My dad was an entrepreneur in the transportation industry. So he had uh, owned a couple of trucks and had his own authority. And one thing I loved about growing up in a trucking household is it afforded me the opportunity to see the country. I remember being in elementary school and middle school and, you know, we'd be in U.S. history or, or geography and we'd be talking about a state. Oh, you know, this happened in Virginia, Colonial Williamsburg. Hey, everybody look around. Have you been there? <laughs> and I could say, yeah, I lived in Virginia before, you know, talking about the Rocky Mountains or, you know, California and everybody's like, okay, we sure Tyrone been there. And so, as early in life, being able to travel and see the kind of the country, that exposure was critical to how I thought and how I saw the world. And so my child, nothing really spectacular or weird really happened, had a pretty stable household. And I was the first of my family to go to college and I didn't graduate. I quituated is what I generally say. Yeah, I love that. You know, went for a semester or two, hung out, party, had a great time. But I always wanted to be like my dad. I wanted to go into the transportation industry. I wanted to drive trucks. I wanted to own a trucking company. And that was really the genesis of the concept of owning real estate started for me because my thing was I wanted to have a trucking company, but I wanted to own a warehouse. And in my mind, I said, I'm going to have this warehouse on the first level and then we'll store freight and stuff like that. On the second level, I want to have me what I called an apartment, but in essence, a loft or something. So that's like my first inclination of any attachment to real estate when I look back over my life. Was your dad involved in any kind of real estate stuff or was he too busy with uh, the transportation logistics stuff? Exactly. He had his head down traveling all over the country. And as I got older, I started to understand why when I was a kid, I'd say, I'm going to be a trucker like my dad. And he'd say, no, I don't want you to be a trucker because as much as I love traveling, seeing the country, meeting new people every day, and just really getting to experience what our, our country looks like. I also remember the times where stuff were happening at school and things of that nature, and he's on the other side of the country, so he couldn't be there. And so, no, he didn't. Um, I mean, he all he had a couple of houses. Well, there's a couple of different phases in our life. I can remember where you know he had bought another house, where we moved up from one house to another. We moved to the burbs, and uh, we had the other house, and ultimately ended up selling it. So he wasn't really a real estate investor. He was just focused on the trucking business. I love that line that you quituated from college. My dad did the same thing, quituated and did great. You've done great. Walk us through, like, after you, after you ended up dropping out of college, what happened next? Did you have any, like, looking back on things, would you have changed anything? Or are you, are you happy with how, like, your decisions that you made? It's easy to say. I think sometimes we kind of romanticize whatever decisions we make, right? And so we'll look back, say, ah, I wouldn't have changed anything. You know, I love how, you know, the reality of the matter is, there are things that transpired in my life that had I stayed in college, it would have made it easier. And I consider myself to be a nerd. I love reading and my, my, my learning and education didn't stop when I left school, but it definitely could have benefited me and helped me be a better entrepreneur, truth be told. 
And um, it would have been a creative to my life. So I definitely, looking back, wish that I would have made some different decisions as it relates to that for me personally. Part of my reasoning for leaving school is I wanted to go drive truck. And so in, you, you have to be 21 to drive trucks. So I was like, you know, I need to spend, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do something until I turn 21 so I can go and, and be, you know, hop in a truck and travel the country. And so ultimately, uh, me and some friends started, you know, we started a marketing company because we thought we could help rappers blow up. I started a, a cleaning business. Um, we there was a, there's a, there's a famous uh, Olympian track athlete named Carl Lewis. We won a contract from him, his properties. And so I started several little menial businesses and held a job and just kind of worked a nine to five job doing different little things, working in warehouses and stuff like that until I turned 21. Once I turned 21, I went out and started driving truck. And then I started, I uh, did that for probably, I did that for a couple of years, just traveling all over the country, which was really formative for me going back to the educational process, because when you're driving a truck from, say, Houston to Detroit, then you take a load from Detroit to Atlanta, then you come back to Houston, and you do that over 10 days. What happens is you're spending a lot of time by yourself in the cab of this vehicle. And what it taught me is how to think. It taught me how to become self-aware because this is pre-internet, you know what I mean? So it wasn't no internet. It wasn't no serious satellite or something to listen. Weren't no such thing as podcasts. You, you had a cassette deck, right? A tape deck. <laughs> exactly. exactly. And so when you ran out of tapes to listen to, then you just kind of looked around at the world and kind of got into your thoughts. And so that really started to help me become more of a, a little bit more cerebral in my thought process. And it helped me lean into the part of me that always longed to learn and educate myself. And I'll never forget driving through Tennessee one day, I stopped in a truck stop and I picked up a book that changed my life. I don't recall the name of it. It was like some rolling, there's these church ministries and they, they'll leave books for guys. And one of these books I read, it talked about how the average person uses three to 4% of their brain power and how someone like Einstein is noted to have used about seven to 8%. And it changed my life because I figured out I can't hurt this by reading. I like literally the term I would tell my buddies is say, dude, we're all walking idiots because we have all this potential that we're not tapping into. And so that's when I just, it took, I always loved reading as a kid, but that really took my desire to read to another level. And I always knew, well, you know, I didn't go to college, but I understood that the world is my university. I just became a seeker, a seeker of knowledge and just looking for opportunities and looking for ways to increase my understanding and knowledge of this world and how it works. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I've always thought like being a trucker would, it's kind of like a, you could have a university on wheels, just listening to stuff throughout the day. Like you can learn so, so much. Especially now, like there's all these really cool things to that, you know, technology that we didn't have back then. Yeah, it's incredible. I heard you took your wife, but at the time, it, like on your first date, I think it was your first date, you took her to a bookstore. Is that right? Yeah. 23 years later, right? That's awesome. So it worked out. Great first date idea. Hey, man, listen, Patrick, when you're broke, you don't have a lot of money and you got your eyes set on something, you got to get creative. And so she was um, an engineer, all kind of education, tremendous, you know, scenarios she had going on for herself, uh, already had a real estate license. And, um, you know, I wanted to take her out and I was thinking, okay. And at that time, at that stage of my life, you know, I spent a lot of time in the bookstores, you know, Back then, this was when you had Borders and Barnes and & Noble, and they had these big, huge stores that had couches and lounge areas. And, you know, here in Houston on Fridays and Saturdays, they have live bands playing. So, like, the bookstore was a happening place. And so I'm thinking, it's free. <laughs> we got all the cool attributes, so let's go hang out here. So, literally, that was our first date. And we still tell that story to this day to friends, and it's always funny. But, yeah, we had our first date at the bookstore. And, and to this day, we still go hang out in the bookstore like we did on our first day. That's awesome. I love it. It's so cool. I wanted to talk a little bit about the trucking. Did you have some real estate stuff, like some tapes that you ended up listening to or anything at that time that like sparked your curiosity? No, I didn't. Really, I didn't. All, all um, back then, I was yeah, singularly focused on trucking because it had been something that I'd wanted to do for so long. And so let me step back for a second. And part of my desire to really be fulfilled, what I call that tr my trucking Jones was that my father passed uh, when I was in eighth grade. And so there was a part of me enjoying trucking with him while at, at a, a later age that I never got to experience. 
And so it was important for me. Like I knew there would be other stuff I do after trucking, but I had to go do this first. I had to go fulfill the part of me that, you know, that I never got to fulfill with him. I never got a chance to drive in the truck, him sitting in the passenger seat and we're, you know, rolling around the country or whatever. So it was important to me that I do that. But no, it, it, I, there was nothing real estate related on my radar at that time. And at that time, that was before like Rich Dad, Poor Dad came out, I would imagine, right? Listen, I'm 49. So we're talking about in 93, 94, like <laughs> Robert Kiyosaki was still broke at that time. He was. He, yeah, he was. That's so funny. I'm trying to think back then, like who the guy would have been. I remember reading, what's the guy's name? It would have been Carlton Sheets. Carlton Sheets. There was another guy, Robert Allen, that had some stuff that I remember reading. Well, Robert hadn't jumped off the porch yet. No, back then it was just because uh, he remember this was in the 90s. It was Carlton Sheets and his uh, infomercial programs that were on television. And those things probably didn't really start hitting the airwaves. Yeah, it was in the 90s. Yeah, in the early 90s or so. Do you remember uh, Tommy Vu, the Tommy Vu infomercials, the Vietnamese guy? I love that. Of course. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. Now, if Tommy came a little bit later, like Carlton was really the the person to open up that whole world of infomercials, selling information and real estate. And there's another, there was a guy named Al Lowry. Like this is old school, old school. Tommy Vu is old school. He he ended up becoming like a, like a great poker player, like playing at the World Championship Poker Series and stuff. Like, wow, who knew? Yeah. Check out his Wikipedia. He's, uh, he's led an interesting life. I will. I loved his infomercials. You know, he's surrounded. He's on a yacht with, you know, ladies in bikinis. <laughs> selling the dream, right? You remember the, local, the two guys that were dwarfs? No. Uh -uh. Yeah, there used to be two guys that were, or little people, I guess, would be the proper pronoun, you know, in this uh, politically correct environment we live in now. But, yeah, there were two guys that were little people that I remember... I want to say they probably did. I seem like I can remember an infomercial they did with Tommy Vu. Seem like I remember Tommy would have his, and then seemed like I remember a time where there would be more than one person or something. But yeah, those. It's funny thinking about this stuff, man. It's crazy. I'm gonna have to go and pull up some of that and post them. I know. I love pulling up like old school stuff like that. It's so funny. It like takes you back to when you were a kid or a teenager or whatever. It's so so fun. So after the trucking, did you get into, I know you became like a mortgage broker at, at a certain point in your career. Is that what happened after the trucking? Yeah. So what happened was after driving truck and then, you know, I went from traveling over the country to want to work locally now because I'm like, you know, making pretty good money. So now I can't enjoy the money because I'm traveling the whole time. So I wanted to start working locally and then I started to want to that's when I really started to get into personal self-development and starting to read more. And so kind of creating my own quasi university, if you will, and, and started studying sales and marketing and things of that nature. And I was like, you know what, now it's time to start tapping into, I never forgot that average person uses four to 5% of their brain power. Let me start tapping, you know, my thing, Hey, let me get to six. I figured out that, you know what, the people who really make a lot of money are salespeople. You know, those are people who can control their incomes. And so I started looking for opportunities to get into sales. And uh, and so at that time, I was in, in uh, transportation management. So I was working for a local company, running a shift for what they call LTL freight. So when you basically when you're buying stuff from Amazon, that's LTL, less than a truckload. And so I was working for a company as a shift supervisor. And I started looking for opportunities to segue from that into some kind of sales position. And, uh, and during that time frame, I met a friend of mine who was already working in the uh, mortgage industry. And he was like, dude, I want to start a mortgage company. And I'm like, a mortgage company? What is that? What do they do? And he's like, well, they provide finances for people who want to buy a house or refinance a house. And in the back of my mind, one day I got an epiphany. I was like, if I understand finance, I can buy, build, or sell anything I want. I'd always had these aspirations of owning real estate, but I hadn't had an entryway or a door to open to give me, you know, access to it. So when he said that, a light bulb went off in my head. And so I was like, dude, let's do it. You know, and uh, we were in the, in his efficiency apartment on the, on the floor one day, and we we're just trying to map it out. And, you know, I came up with a name we called us and let's call it the mortgage outlet. What year would that have been? Like the 90, early nineties, 94, five. That point in time, this was probably uh, around 98, 99. This is around 99. 
So the mortgage outlet, and so it was, it was your own baby, right? This is like your first. Me and my part. Well, it was, it was my, it was basically me and my partner. Um, it was his concept was the more, I just came up with the name and we partnered together and got an office and, you know, he already has some connections. And so we started the company, but now to get me some experience. So what he was, was he was an account rep for a company. And, you know, so the account rep would go to different mortgage brokers and say, Hey, here's our suite of loans. If you have a client that fits our buyer profile, you know, we'd love to be able to fund that deal. And so what he did was got me a job working in an office of a guy of one of his mortgage broker buddies so that I could learn and earn at the same time. So we had set up the mortgage outlet, but he was still working his job. So I was working there to, for another mortgage broker to kind of learn the business while we were, we could close a deal, then get an office, computers and stuff like that for the mortgage outlet. So we kind of segued into the industry like that. The broker that I initially worked for, and this is, again, this is early, uh, late 90s. So, you know, I was pretty much answering the phone, doing faxes and stuff like that. But that's what I was doing. But right, the rate sheet would come in, right? On the fax exactly. machine. Yeah. There you go. Exactly. The rate sheet comes in, you know, this is the programs we offer and so on and so forth. So, but his niche was subprime lending. And so that was the niche we went into. So we say, hey, okay, great. Let's go here. And so we started putting out bandit signs, you know, this is way before they became popular, but we didn't have a way to market and we needed to get business. And so we were like, you know, let's just go pollute, let's go create all this visual pollution by putting this signs on, on street posts and um, in different intersections. And that's how we started to drum up business. Was it Delta Mortgage? Was that the big subprime company? Does that name ring a bell? Was well, back then, uh, Delta, I probably saw Delta, but there were several lenders. There was Option One, New Street Loans. Shortly after, Andrew Mozilla created Countrywide. Who were so, uh, yeah, let me see. Who, who else? Yeah, they were first community, uh, first credit, what was it? First community credit. So, yeah, that, those are the subprime days. There was a lot. We know how that turned out. Here's the story I tell, and we may be getting ahead of ourselves. So, you know, sometimes... Like right now, a lot of people are looking at our current real estate environment and they're thinking, comparing it to the global financial crisis we had in 2009. And the story I tell people, I say, listen, you know, it's one thing to read this, you know, to watch the big short or one of these movies or you're online Googling or one of your teachers is telling you about it. I say, but I was there. I was a lender. I say, and I remember when I first started in lending, there was a loan called a no money down loan, 100% loan. That meant if you're buying a house for, let's just say, 200000 the lender would give you all 200000 In fact, they would give you 200000 plus up to 6% in concessions. So we literally had clients that would put $1,000, $2,000 earnest money and not have to bring any money to table to buy their homes. We literally had people that would get cash back at closing because we wrap all their closing costs into the loan. And now they got back their refund of their earnest money at closing. So they bought a house for 200 grand and you leave closing with a check for $2,500, $3,000. But you need to at least, when I first started, a 620 credit score to do that. Okay. Then time keeps going. Now you need a 600. Then they lowered it to 580. Then they lowered it to 560. Then they lowered it to 540. Then they lowered it to 520. I'll never forget the lender. They're called MILA, M I L A, Mortgage Investment Lenders of America is what name a big ride of Minnesota or Oregon, somewhere up on the, in that corridor of the country. And I remember thinking to myself, Patrick, now I'm still fresh just a couple of years into the industry, but I remembered because me and my wife bought our house with a no money down loan. And I knew it took us having a 620 for the lender. We went with it. We had to have a 640 credit score. And because we did dealt with subprime, I was familiar with credit scores and people on the lower end of the spectrum. I saw those credit reports on a daily basis. So when I saw that they were now allowing you to get a no money down loan with 560, 580, I'm like, dude, if you got a sub 600 credit score, you got some charge offs, you may even have a repossession that's old or something like that. Who's money, who's lending their money to these people with no down payment? And even though I didn't know what was going on, I knew that I was like, man, this ain't going to end right. Something weird is going to happen. And I just didn't have experience to, or point of reference to know but I remember when I saw that 520 fax come over from Milo, I was like, this ain't going to be in good. And so I tell people, now I juxtapose that to today. The average borrower today has 680, 700 credit scores. So it's never been more difficult than it is today to get a mortgage. So 
there's a whole element to how easy it was to get money that we had 08 and 09 that we don't have today that makes this market different. And I know they always say, oh, we, this time is different. I fundamentally believe this time is different. Don't mean we won't have a crash. Don't mean there won't be things that happen to the economy because those are cycles and cycles have to happen. But one thing I say is they never look the same. The things you're looking for that happened in 08, 09, we don't have that same combination of factors. There's some other converging things that are going on. I had the same experience. I had a really close buddy who was, in, who was a mortgage broker right around the same time you were. And I remember him saying, he said, I can literally, it feels like I can print money for these people. It's like, and when he said that, I was like, oh man, this is like not going to end well. I don't know what, what year that would have been, but. Me and another one of our colleagues on Twitter, we call it, we call them the old fog a mirror loan. If you can put a mirror here and fog it up, you can get a loan. You know what I mean? Like literally, if you had a pulp, you could get a loan. There was a loan product out there for you. Whereas today you could have, I mean, we have clients because my wife's a real estate broker. So she runs that whole size. We have clients that are, have 680 credit scores, but there's one little blip from 10 years ago or some God awful amount of time ago. And lenders are, you know, really scrutinizing these different things. So it's just totally a different market from a perspective of being able to get capital to buy assets. Back then, we had 100% down loans for second homes. So you could buy a second home with no down payment. <laughs> like, it's crazy. Well, it's like that scene in the big short where uh, I forget the guy's name, Mark Baum or whoever the main, the, uh, I forget the guy's name, Steve Carell, the, his, his character, he, he goes to the stripper, the strip joint. And she's like, she's got like five houses or something like that. Right. You know? right. Like she's taking her clothes off. Right. 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 I love that movie. Let's jump into how you got into actual real estate stuff. So you're doing the mortgage stuff. You're out surrounded. You know, you're, you're learning the industry. You're learning the financial side of it. It sounds like that was a bit of your plan to, to know that first. How did you get into buying homes, fixing them up, buying them, like you say, old raggedy houses? I, I love that phrase, too. Again, it was a step being becoming a mortgage broker was a stepping stone. It was a serendipitous step. I wanted to understand finance. And so. What began to happen by virtue of dealing with, in certain cases, subprime, we would get people that would call us that were in situations where they, they were behind three, four, five months and stuff like that and facing foreclosure or, or something like that. And so the first house I bought was from, it was a referral from a colleague of mine who was an investor and it was coming around Christmas time and he was just so bombarded with some stuff. He's like, man, here, call these people. They want to, you know, a loan. If they can't get a loan, they want to sell. Long story short, it was a family, it was an older couple that they had just really, they weren't in a financial bind as much as they had just gotten tired of being homeowners. You know, they're up in age and they just wanted to get basically a, what I call a hassle-free lifestyle. And so they're like, hey, listen, refinancing will be cool, but we still would have a mortgage. We don't want that. We just want to be done with all this. And so I was like, man, I'll buy this house from you. Let me buy it from you and, and I'll give you some capital so that you can move on. And so I bought a house. Uh, we put $9,000 in it. We paid uh, one of our painters, and to this day I laugh, we paid him $6,000 to paint this house, which was a lot. He was an expensive painter. So we went and put him in this house. Today I get that same job done for 2500 bucks. But anyway, paint the house for $6,000. And then I did $1,000 in landscape and $2,000 in something else. But we spent nine grand and we turned around and listed the house and sold it. And I think we made about twenty two, twenty four thousand, twenty two thousand. 24,000, 22,000, I think, net. That feels good. Yeah, I looked at my life and my wife was like, a minute. As I was a broker, we would do buy a house or two here or there. I bought a duplex of 42,000. And I learned a valuable landlord lesson that I'll get into in the second year if that comes up. So we started buying a house or two here or there, you know. And this was before the, the 2008 crisis, right? Like 2005 or so? Exactly. Yeah, this is 03, 04, 05, 06, and stuff like that. So we're buying a house or two here or there. You know, we keep one, we sell one. At this point, this was a side hustle, right? You were doing this on the side, you still? Yeah, the transition out of lending was one day, you know, I'm talking to someone like yourself, you want a six and a half percent interest rate. And I'm like, man, Patrick, listen, the best that we can get right now is six and three quarters. And I looked up against the wall and I'm like, dude, I didn't get into the game to be hackling over a quarter or an eighth of a basis points on a rate. This is only a stepping stone. And so it was like, that was that moment where I said, you know what, let me go ahead and transition into the next phase of this. And so 
So I told my wife, hey, listen, we're going to start doing more investing. And so that's what we did. I went out and bought an old uh, Ragley house over in a part of Houston we call uh, Sunnyside. And I'll never, 5146 Higgins is the address. And the reason why I remember it, because that house gave me pure hell. Everything from there was a, a homeless guy that was stealing the aluminum siding off the house. So I'd come and we had this amount of siding and I'd come back two days later. One and a half of my whole wall is gone. I see him park down the, down the street, taking my side to go sell it. <laughs> we were doing the roof. I didn't know that there was a fire that had happened in the house. So, so we uncovered all this fire damage. My contractor was taking advantage of me. It just every mistake that could possibly happen, happened on that house. And the, the nail in the coffin on that deal was I knew it had termites, right? Because we saw a little dirt. So I'm thinking, okay, we got a couple of boards we're going to replace around this window. And we pulled the sheetrock back and I see this two by four stud. And I literally, I, I grabbed the stud. Some made me grab the stud. Let me find a piece of paper here. I have to give you a visual. I can imagine. It just went like poop. Yeah. <laughs> so I, there's this stud, right? And I grab it. And Patrick, literally, this paper is giving me more resistance than the stud. The termites had eaten up the entire interior of this two by four. And the only thing left was the shell. And you come to find out the whole front wall of the house had just been decimated by termites. And I said, dude, I could actually build a house with less headache and hassle than this piece of crap. Like, this is crazy. And so that house made me start to look at wanting to do new construction because I was like, new construction is easier. Then I went out and found a new construction project where there were 12 houses to be built on a lot. They had already built it. Uh, they had already built the streets and subdivided. All you had to do was basically uh, get your plans approved and then go out and build the houses. At that stage, I still was a mortgage broker. We had a real estate team. And I started to now say, okay, let me set up a home building company and start to go in the direction of home building because I'd done investing, had some rentals, had flipped some houses. The next iteration was becoming a builder. So how did that end up? You bought Horrible. 12 <laughs> lots? You bought 12 lots? Is that what you said? Yeah. Well, so one of the, th the advantages of becoming a lender was it taught me a concept I, I call deal structure, understanding how to structure a deal, how to finance and so on and so forth. So I put $5,000 earnest down. It was $750,000 to purchase. It was 14 lots. Yeah, it was 14 lots. And so the way I negotiated the contract was I had a takedown schedule. So I take down these lots at these different timelines. And so I took down the first one, got started, took down the second one. And that's as far as I got. I got two houses constructed and ultimately had to sell off the other remaining lots and cut my losses on that project. And I, my valuable lesson in that particular scenario was at that stage of the game, what I ultimately figured out about myself is I love design. I love the minor nuances, you know, designing the cabinet, what kind of crown molding and trim is going to go here. You know, all the little minutia stuff that you have to do as a builder. But see, that wasn't a builder project. That was a developer. I needed to be in a developer mindset. So having conversations with capital partners, having conversations about what our IRR is going to be and making sure that the builder or project manager was taking care of all that minutia. I needed to be focused on the big picture. So the lesson I learned there is, is the, the, the differentiation in the roles. There's a builder, there's a developer, there's even a project manager. A lot of times, or at that stage of the game, I got, the, I got all of those confused because I just didn't know what I didn't know. That was uh, one of many lessons I learned. Then I also learned the power of partnership because I did that whole undertaking by myself. However, the guys I bought it from, one of the guys that was a partner in that project that who, who were sold me the land was worth 23 million. Here I am by myself. I definitely wasn't worth 23 million. But the point is, if this guy's worth 23 million and he has three other partners, what makes me think I can play in that same arena by myself as he man? So I learned the value of partnership. I learned the value of understanding what my strengths are, becoming self-aware. I wanted to be on site with the guys on the daily braces, bring back, bring them tacos. And I wanted to be there to see the magic happen. Did you take a hit financially then on that? Or was it more just like you got in a little over your head and you were able to get away from the project without too much damage? No, definitely took a financial hit. Definitely took a financial hit. Lost a lot of money and time. Because one of the concepts is you got to fail fast. Hey, if you're going to fail, fail fast. And so, you know, I prolonged it. I should have sought out partners earlier on. I should have did several things that would allow me to be able to recover from that quicker, but I didn't. So it took a, it took a while to get through that. And really uh, it hurt my 
emotions, you know, it hurt my ego, had to go back and kind of reevaluate. So when you, what I always tell people is when, when you get it wrong, you actually go back and start second guessing yourself. And that's really when you get introspective and it causes you to be a little bit more humble. And then you start to recognize your mistakes. When you get it right, you know, you think I'm the smartest guy in the world and everything is going to go the way that went. So what began to happen is after that, dusted myself off. And then in the process of doing that, here's the other thing. Other thing that was transpiring is I had my mortgage business that now began to suffer and our real estate team because I was so focused on the building side. So it really put me in a compromising position. And like I said, I had to spend some time, regroup and come back and, and get ready to go at it again. So did you regroup after 2008? Like at what stage of the game did you start getting kind of get back into feeling good about what you were doing and on more firm, you know, a foundation that's firm? When did that happen? The biggest challenge to taking control of your personal finances, improving your investment returns and building a better future is just getting started. This means getting organized, having a plan and being disciplined. As Mark Twain once said, the secret to getting ahead is getting started. To break out of the treadmill of slaving away each week only to have nothing left over, watching the savings you have get eroded away by inflation's vicious bite, or freeing yourself from the corporate grind. It all requires you to master the conversion of time into value. To help you do this, we created a list of four simple steps to taking control of your personal finances and life. And you can download it for free by clicking the link in today's description. After that project, you had to do some more loans and keep the lights on, if you will. But, you know, I knew that, you know, hey, I'll get this right. You know, that one didn't turn out right, but I just got to dust myself off and keep going. And so then I'd done, you know, the new construction, I'd done old houses. And so I figured, well, let me go back and start buying some old houses again. And so, you know, I bought an old house, we renovated, fixed it up and sold it. And at that stage, when I did that particular house, I was able, because I didn't have all these projects going on. So I could just focus on this one house and really give it the attention it needed. And it became an amazing little house. It just had some really cool features. And that house was the house that really opened the can of worms from a design perspective for me to help me figure out, you know, you're really gifted in this space if you dedicate the time and attention to doing what you're good at. Figure out what your genius is and zone in on that. And so that house is when I started to develop a formula uh, for how we like to buy. It helped me develop what my buy box is. It helped me figure out where I wanted to play, what kind of communities I wanted to start to impact. And so I started to formulate this vision of something that I had when I was a kid. One thing we didn't talk about early on in my life, I remember there was a period when my mom was trying to buy a house and it was very difficult uh, for her. We had some land. She wanted to build a house. And so ultimately ended up buying a house in, in Fifth Ward. But long story short, I remembered looking at some of the houses and was like, man, if I were selling this house, I would have done this or I would have done this. And there's these different little design things I would have done just to make it nicer. You know, it's one thing to be affordable, but it doesn't have to look like it's affordable housing. So that's when I started to develop this design sentiment. And so from there, I started to say, okay, let me go find another house that's old house that has this character, you know, old craftsman houses. Let me go find another one of those. And I did another one and I started to get good at taking really old houses, keeping the things, some of the old aesthetics about them that made them houses that people love, but also bringing them up to date so that the people who want, you know, the preacher conference that we offer now with the modern amenities and things of that nature. So it's more so it's like a design fusion, if you will. What were you paying for these homes back when at this stage? We paid a. Uh, so like uh, when I first started buying, we were buying from, say, 40 to 60 and we were putting somewhere between 40 to 60 in these houses and we were selling them, you know, anywhere from 140 to about 180 or so. Because one of my things is I wanted to redevelop communities like in my neighborhood I grew up in, which is Fifth Ward, Third Ward, Second Ward, Sunnyside and communities like that. The hood, if you will, I wanted to make the hood nicer. And then I came up with uh, what became the mission statement for my company, Houston Vintage Homes, was reshaping the face of inner city Houston one home at a time. Yeah, I love that. I've done something similar just buying old raggedy houses because it's like, I mean, you can go wrong, but you can't go too wrong. You know, it's a great way to get started and just to learn, you know, for anybody that's getting started, buy an old raggedy house and maybe it'll work out, maybe it won't, but you'll learn a ton is kind of my feeling. 
I've heard it termed as baptism by fire. Right. That's true. It's true. But what I tell people that, you know, I talk to people all the time now and they say, oh, hey, listen, I want to become a developer. I want to get started and build. And I say, okay, great. Go buy the ragliest house you can and renovate it. And look, to your point, you're going to learn so much. See, doing an old house is way more, is more difficult than building a new house. But see, here's the thing. But if you go build a house first, you're going to think that's the most hardest thing you've ever done. Versus if you do that old house first, building new is going to be easy because you got a point of reference. You got something to compare it to. Then there's certain things you're going to do different from a management perspective, how you handle your trades. And then one thing I love about old houses or by having an existing home versus new construction is very difficult to pivot when you're doing new construction. Having lived through the global financial crisis, I saw so many builders go out of business because you got a new development, you got all this money sunk in the ground. You can't pivot. This was before build to rent. So you can't pivot. Whereas if you have a house and it's existing, like right now we have a house where our budget was $90,000. We saw the market start to shift a little bit. So we said, okay, rather than spend all 90 on this house, we're only going to do about 60, which means we got an extra $30,000 while we refinance out. And since we're not selling it at this dollar amount, we'll sell at a lower amount or we'll just refinance, keep it as a rental and wait till the market to transition. So when you have an existing structure versus a going from the ground up new construction, it gives you a little bit of opportunity to pivot if you need to. But I think it's a great way to start. Now, here's the thing. As you're going through that process, you're going to hate it. You're going to get frustrated. You're going to get ticked off with all the stuff that's going to happen. But it's literally giving you a bachelor's degree in real estate investing, construction management, budgeting, and things of that nature. And so there's so much that you'll learn from doing that initial old house. And then if you hate it, never do it again. You have that experience. If you love it and you're weird like me, you're pain free, you're crazy like you, you'll do it again. I wanted to hear what your strategy a little bit. Once these are fixed up, are you holding them in a portfolio? Or are you selling them off? Is it a mix of both? Talk to me about how you think about that. So part of our mission in reshaping these communities is helping people from these communities who now left. Like, so when I was in Fifth Ward, my first whole thing was, we got to get out of here, right? Then now Fifth Ward is the hottest area in city of Houston right now. So my mission is we have to sell some units, one, to create liquidation events. The other reason why we got to sell is because we want to help more people get into these areas, people that are from these areas. And then the reality of the matter, they're, we're in a city that's growing. So everyone in these areas aren't going to be from the community. So there are other people that deserve living in a nice neighborhood as well. So we want to be able to service them a product. We keep some, we sell some, and what dictates whether we keep it or sell it at this stage of the game is what, how did, where does that deal plays? Where are we at in the market? What's going on around us that will dictate if we're going to sell it or not? Our buy box, what dictates what we buy is this. So my buy, my strategy is simple. I'll buy any house in any condition if you sell it to me for land value. Because my premise is now I have a structure. I've gotten that structure for free. Now, here's a little bit more thought into that. And now a lot of houses I buy, people say, that's a teardown. Why would you buy that house? I say, well, here's the thing. If I tear it down, and that now I got to get plans designed, engineered, permitted, and approved. That's anywhere from four to six months in a city like Houston on the low side. That same house that you think is a teardown in four months, it's a brand new house. We've renovated, ran through it front backwards, and now it's ready to be sold or rented out. If, you're, if I tore it down, I haven't even started construction yet. I don't even have a permit yet. Not only is it faster in certain respects, it's also, it can also be financially more advantageous. Because if I'm buying a vacant lot in a building or if I tear it down and I build, I'm pretty much got to pay cash for it because the lender's not going to give me the money to tear it down, then wait six months for me to start building it for another four to six months. So I'm at the pay cash, with that, which that's more capital intensive. If I'm going to renovate it, it's easy to get hard money or private capital or whatever to buy it, renovate it and service it to the market. Yeah. And at minimum, you probably have the foundation. You probably have... You might have to do a little framing, you know, like it sounded like one of the projects you had a fire. You might have to do a little reframing, but it definitely expedites things and you're buying it at a great price. So it sounded like you got in early to these areas when nobody else really wanted to be there. They weren't maybe a handful of people, but are you seeing more and more people as, as the fifth ward becomes the place to be? What's it like now? What's the market like now? Is it harder to buy homes? And Yeah. So I put it to you like this. Now they call Fifth Ward East River. So you know when the phraseology changes, that's a marketing thing. And so you can already understand what's happening. You know, now if you were to ride 
If you know, if you came to Houston, we roll around, you'll see people walking their dog and stuff like that. When I was growing up, it was the bloody nickel, the bloody nickel for a reason. I tend to be a trailblazer. I tell people I want to be a reason. I want to be a part of the reason why in the future people feel comfortable in these areas. When I first bought my, but the first lot I bought in Fifth Ward was $7,000. Fast forward to today, I have a lot that I'm selling in that area and we're going to sell it for 150000 Just a lot. Yeah. Saying when I bought that lot, I bought that lot pre-GFC. I think I bought that lot in um, around 2007, 2006, 2006, 2007. I paid seven grand. Today, they're 150000 so no, Fifth Ward and all of inner city Houston has just taken off because back in the mid nineties, Houston started growing at 10, 15% a year annually. And no, and, and so our inner city corridor took off, but also our perimeter, our slippers took off as well. And so these close in areas though have really thrived. And my biggest regret as most investors have is I didn't buy more, didn't buy more when I had the opportunity to. Yeah, I've got the same feeling. I, I was in a similar area that that is now since gentrified, but ten years ago, nobody wanted to be in this area uh, in my part of Columbus, and now it's the cool place to be. And there's whatever art galleries and breweries and restaurants, and it's totally changed. And so I interviewed a guy. I wanted to hear your thoughts on this when people maybe critique you for gentrification. So you, you know that those neighborhoods change. It forces out people that have lived there. They say you're a gentrifier. I interviewed a guy who I don't know if you've heard of. John Marsh is his name. Chris Powers interviewed him. He, he lives in a town called Opelika, Alabama. And I highly recommend you check this guy out because you would love him. He basically rebuilt his like depressed old town in Alabama. And I think he's done like 300 buildings. He's helped start 60 businesses in the town, like be a part of that. But he, he calls it, you know, when he started, it was a depressed area that nobody wanted to be in. And, you know, now people come from hours away to check this town out. And so he calls it redemptification. He says, I didn't gentrify this place. I redemptified it. And I love that. I love that phrase. How do you, how do you respond to people that are like, ah, you're just a gentrifier? Well, my first question is how much land do you own in the area where you're from? You know what I mean? My thing is everybody has an opinion and who am I to say it's valid or invalid? It's okay to own an opinion, but I want you to own something else. See, I don't have to tell you my opinion because you can drive to the communities where I'm from and see my opinion in the real world. So I'm less interested in hearing your opinion. I'm more interested in seeing it. Point number one. Point number two, the neighbor, remember I said this was the bloody nickel. Where were you at when, I, when the lenders wouldn't lend to me in Fifth Ward and I had to figure out how to buy the property? Where were, were you calling it then? And then there's an education. There's two things. There's an educational component that's lacking as it comes, as it relates to this topic. And gentrification as a word has a bad PR. They need a better PR team. Most people really want gentrification. They really do. Because like, you know, I'm buying houses that have been vacant for 10, 15, 20 years that are derelict properties. Most people want more money for the schools. They want cops. They want sidewalks. They want lights on the street. Well, in my neighborhood, which is Fifth Ward, it had the highest concentration of tax delinquent locks in all of Houston. So when we're seeing bad crime and things of that nature, what we're not connecting that is there's no tax base because most of the land is vacant or derelict. So how can you have all these services that you're mad are being provided when the city can't provide them because the funds aren't there? So you really want gentrification. What you're mad about and what you don't want is displacement. Most people conflate or confuse the two. Gentrification and displacement are two totally separate things. Displacement is creating an environment where the people from those areas or you push those people out of those areas. We are bringing people from those areas back into those areas or people like me who one day I recognized that when I was growing up, the guys that were on the block that I looked up to were drug dealers. And I recognize as much as I love my neighborhood, my community, I can't raise my son here because I don't want him having to endure the same things I did. So that became a part of my reasoning for wanting to change the area. So it's important for us to understand what we're really talking about, what we're calling gentrification. Gentrification has a negative connotation. What you're really mad about is displacement. And the bigger issue of displacement and gentrification is affordable housing. America short six to eight million houses, depending on whose math you want to subscribe to. That's the bigger issue is that we don't have enough affordable housing. If we have more affordable housing, then displacement wouldn't be an issue 
and people wouldn't be upset that the neighborhood is looking nicer. But because we don't have enough affordable housing, any progress you see in an area, you automatically have a negative connotation and you call it gentrification. You call people like us that make neighborhoods better gentrifiers. But if you really understood the reason why your sidewalks are jacked up, the streets are torn up and things of that nature, then you would see it a little bit differently. So to me, I love having these conversations because, you know, I ask people, well, you know, when these areas were derelict, I have a property that we did not long ago where the property had been vacant over 15 years. Let's think about this if you're the city. They're probably getting $500 a year in taxes on that house. Boom, fast forward, we fixed up and make it nice. Now they're getting $2,000 a year from that one property. Now let's extrapolate that and do that over 10, 15, 20, 30 houses in a concentrated area. You now just change what that area looks like from a civic perspective, which means now you have school, you have money to enhance the schools, get a park built and things of that nature. It's a multi-pronged conversation with several different layers to it. It's, it's an onion. There are all these different layers and we got to peel them back and deal with each one. Yeah. And I mean, the thing is, you're taking something that's just like a blight on the neighborhood. And if you're fixing a house up, that alone is like making a huge difference to the people that that are around that house. Psychologically, spiritually, like everything. This John Marsh guy had an interesting saying that he talking about his town. He said he didn't feel like he'd be a success until the person that's lowest on the socioeconomic ladder is like enjoying the kind of life that the person at the top is, you know, that that there's like some equity in that the guy at the bottom is like enjoying his town and, and is having a great time living there. Most certainly. You know, Patrick, one thing I tell people is like, y'all post a picture of a house or something like that online and, you know, people say, hey, it's great and this, that, and other, and I appreciate that. What I always tell people, what's most impactful to me isn't those great comments from people who are distant and just see it from afar. It's when the guy walks up to me and say, man, let me tell you who used to live here. Man, thank you for doing what you're doing to this house. Let me tell you, you know, I remember it used to be people in here doing drugs and there was this happening, this happening. And that happens over and over and over again. We have a project right now where when the neighbors saw what we were doing to the two houses next to them, the son called me one, or he left the num his number with uh, one of my guys. I called him. He said, hey, listen, when we saw what you were doing to that house, we wanted you to have our house. Our mom is, we're going to move her into a, a facility. We would want you to have our house and they only did that because they saw how nice we made the house look to them. And so, again, going back to the people who generally have, and this isn't everyone, but my, my thing is the people that are in the community, what do they say? And the people in the communities where we operate and how we operate, they bring us other houses. I can show you example after example of we go and, and renovate this one house. Then somebody down the street says, hey, listen, won't you come by this house? Because we need to make that house look like this. Yeah, I've had the same experience and it is a great feeling. I, I do want to get into like the affordability issue. What, what do you feel like are some concrete steps that could be taken to, sol you know, I don't know if it's going to solvable, but start moving in the direction of fixing it? So the first thing, and this is what I always tell, um, so I'm fortunate enough to be in Houston. We have a community called Livable Places and they're the people who are responsible for creating our development guidelines and things of that nature in the city. And so by virtue of that, I end up talking to a lot of people who are in politics and things of that nature. I want to say, they ask me that same question. I say, well, the first thing you can do is get for affordable housing. We should be able to get a house permitted in 30, maybe 60 days max. If we could cut down the time it takes for me to have a set of plans like this to having them permitted and approved, if we can cut that time down, that's going to help guys like me who provide this housing because for me to go buy a lot and then have my capital tied up in this lot, four, five, six months going through permitting. I mean, all I'm doing is having to also forward those costs over to the buyer, which increases the price. So the first thing is allow us to get houses permitted and approved quicker is the first thing. There are obviously different kind of uh, tax incentives they, that they can offer, down payment assistance for the buyers, subsidized financing where you can get maybe lower uh, rates for first time home buyers and people who are buying and, you know, at certain price points with certain income levels and things of that nature. So there's many different things that we can do. There's no shortage of land bank programs and things of that nature that are already around. But to me, I think one of the, the hands that swings this really big door is if we could get plans approved quicker, like it would change. And, I, and this is why I always tell city officials, not even just for affordable, but for all of your housing, like that's the biggest bottleneck is, hey, I want to build X. Well, the amount of time that it takes for us to go from here's what can be built there to actually having a permit to build 
is so long, so cost prohibitive that it forces the cost of housing to go up because we as, as, as developers have to take all these risks or you buy land. I have a scenario right now where one of my uh, mentees bought some land. And unfortunately, because the city didn't do, in Houston, our, our drainage guidelines have changed because of flooding and rightfully so. But because basically the city doesn't have a water connection to this property, which is on city, you know, it's on city water. They have to spend what would take about one hundred and seventy to one hundred eighty thousand dollars just so that they could have city dr- water and drain. And I'm like, that piece of land will never get built and developed. And from the city, like the city, like you guys, that's a part of your responsibility as a city to provide these things. And so. And so there's different levels, but I think helping us be able to get properties permitted quicker is going to be something that would really open the door to a lot more affordable housing being provided in the marketplace. Yeah, it's a good point. I experienced the same thing here and it's super frustrating. I wanted to get your thoughts on, are you still sticking with old raggedy houses or are you doing more ground up building? Doing Right now, as business evolves, you know, you start getting older. I have a son who's a junior in high school right now, things of that nature. I love that there's a part of me that operates in a comfort zone. And so that's me buying old Ragley houses. And we do build as well. So we do new construction, build duplexes and single family stuff like that. And so I always keep a mix. But over the last year or so, I've started to wean off of my buying as many old Ragley houses as much. You know, we've been buying some apartment complexes and, and some bigger projects. I also have a design firm. So we do a lot of design work of different areas for other people. And so I've kind of been growing that. I really want to grow that to be a little bit bigger. It'll, it, it affords me the opportunity early on, yes, or before we got on, uh, got live, we asked about doing work like in Cleveland and other markets. So my design firm allows me an opportunity to impact other markets without it having to be my project or dollars. So that's what I love. Uh, I've been ramping that up, but going back to asset classes. And so we started looking at a little bit bigger projects Right now, we have a pretty extensive pipeline of new construction development projects that are coming down that, you know, we have a, a, a courtyard development project that we're working on that's going to be really cool because there hadn't been any courtyard developments in Houston in since like the 60s or 70s. We have some just some uh, really cool patio home projects that we're developing right now. And so we do do new construction. I just love old ragged houses, so I talk about it more. I don't really talk about new construction because it's just not as exciting to me. Because the part of me that is not very patient, you know, see, when you're doing new construction, you got to do a whole bunch of planning work so that you can then do a whole bunch of permitting work so that you can then get ready to actually do the work of building it. So you got to work three, four or five times before you actually get to an end result. Whereas if I find a house today, we close in three weeks, the day I close, we're actually got activity and stuff going on. So that's why I like on houses because I can get to activity faster. And then the other thing is for us, I like to have a mix. I don't always want to only have all houses going. I always want to have all new builds going because for me and my, how I like to operate, I think you need a comfortable mix if you want to be able to coexist and last through these ebbs and flows of the market. We talked about Donovan Adesoro, who's doing duplexes, and I think he's moving on to like some bigger projects. How are you seeing like things in Houston, like with rates going up, home prices going up? Just like where we are in the market cycle, I wanted to hear your thoughts on that, how you're, what strategically, how you're thinking about it. Which goes back. So to me, I think you have to have an evergreen business strategy. And so what I mean by that is you always have minor pivots and adjustments you'll make within your business model. But ultimately, fundamentally, I don't want to have to change whole, wholeheartedly everything we do. And so that's why we keep a certain amount of these type of, that's why we keep a certain amount of old uh, houses, if you will, and a certain amount of, of new bills. The market as a whole in general in Houston, like Houston is a very thriving market, is continuing to grow, you know, between Houston, Dallas, San Antonio and Austin, they project, you know, somewhere between 20 and 25 percent of all Americans will live there over the next zero to 10 years. So we, by default, are very blessed to be in this market. I think Houston is one of the best markets in the country. And the biggest thing is we're kind of losing our affordability reputation because, you know, we're still relatively affordable compared to the other major metropolitan cities. But for those of us that have been here, we've watched, you know, there's in 2015 in some of the same areas Donovan and I both uh, work in, you know, I can recall, you can buy a three bedroom, two bath, a brand new home, 1500 square feet for 159,000 in 2015. Today, that house, exact same house is now 330, $340,000. 
you know, those of us that have a long memory, we remember when it was 159,000. Well, we're never going back there. And so Houston's growing and thriving. It's a wonderful market, very dynamic. And there's so much that you could do. Like there's so many niches here that you could, you know, build a tremendous business in. And so it's a great market. And um, yeah, it's just going to continue to go up. Yeah, I wanted to hear your take. You, I saw a tweet that you put out within the past week or so. It was talking about what asset class would you choose to have like passive income, like truly <laughs> passive income. Do you, do you know what I'm talking about? The tweet you you sent out and it got a ton of responses. I wanted to hear your thoughts on it. Like what some of the thoughts that people shared that you, that you liked. I mean, man, it was some, it was so many great ideas there. And what, so there's one of the things I wanted to do in Houston's a big metro transportation hub, and obviously I have a transportation background. One of the things I've always wanted to own and even more so now as I get older is uh, like basically truck stored parking lots. So, you know, guys who drive an 18 wheeler, you know, they want to be able to park their truck somewhere close to where they live. And that, and so I had several people that mentioned parking lots. And so that's a, that's a niche that kind of, because once you put your asphalt out, you got a mechanic shop, a little restaurant there, light, you know, the mechanic shop is ran by a mechanic, the restaurant, some guy with a taco truck or lady with a taco truck, and that's it. And so there's not anything to manage. I mean, it's just dirt. I mean, you're just collecting rent. So that's one of the really passive ideas that's been juggling around in my mind. I've been watching some guys do that here locally. But there were several asset classes, you know, everything from a uh, single tenant net leases, uh, STNLs, of people talked about those triple net opportunities. And then there were the people that said, there's no such thing as passive. I said, okay, great. I got you. The tweets it as close to passive, right? It's pre or you're going to do something, but there are asset classes and there are different structures that allow you to be more passive than others. Another one is lending. You know, we've done some lending before and we'll probably do a little bit more here in the future but being able to land uh to quality operators who you understand their business they don't take too much risk and you know they're able to get in and out of projects is a fairly profitable and quasi passive opportunity and yeah the, and so those are some of the opportunities that were highlighted and uh yeah it was a great tweet though it was really informational and i like to sometimes tweet stuff or put the information out there that will cause smart people to think and share their ideas and that was the really goal that I wanted to have there. And I had so many people reach out to me and say, hey, thank you for tweeting it. I got so many great ideas. And that was really what what um, I wanted to do there. Well, you've got a ton of followers. I'm not sure how many now, like 20 or 30,000 at least, I think. What's your take on Twitter? How's it affected your your business, your personal life? Twitter, uh, jokingly, I tell everybody, I say Twitter's like revenge of the nerds. Like all the nerds get to hang out and vibe and be cool on Twitter. Twitter's been amazing, man, for me connecting with people like yourself from various parts of the country. And to me, it's like an entrepreneur college is what I call it. It's like entrepreneur, it's like entrepreneur college slash country club slash business fraternity slash the high net worth social media platform amalgamation, if you will. Like it's just a lot of different things all into one. Now, obviously you can go into these little silos of, politics and all this other stuff. And, you know, you can curate your feed however you want. But for me, Twitter's just been a great place to network with some of the greatest minds in the world and freely, like people are so freely given. Like I tell, like there's a, you know, it's literally a million dollars worth of information on your timeline on any given day. And if you just read a tweet or two or three or four or five and then go offline and take action, right? On some of that. So go study it deeper, get some more information like, it's amazing what you can learn there. And so Twitter's been very, very instrumental. I always tell people, hey, man, you should get on Twitter. And they're like, what? Twitter? Trust me, you have no idea. And some do, some don't. But hey, listen, I'm glad, I, I'm, glad I'm there and active and engaged in the market. They're missing out if they're not on. They really are. 100%. I mean, I think, and it's continuing to grow. Like, I remember when retweet wasn't really a thing. Now it's a big thing. You know, it's been written about and so on and so forth. And uh yeah, it's a really cool place to network and meet really cool people to learn, grow, and then create value for others. You had mentioned some mentees. I wanted to talk about that a little bit. What are some of the things, aside from getting on real estate Twitter, that you tell some of the younger people that are coming to you asking for advice? What are some of the things I tell them? One, get started. A lot of times, so what happens a lot of times, you'll come on a place like Twitter and you get all these different ideas and stuff like that. So, you know, you got to be self like. There's guys out there to do big industrial stuff like that. Hey, it's plenty of money there. It's cool. It's awesome, exciting. But 
you got to be self-aware. It doesn't really interest me. You know what I mean? So I'm more, you know, so I find the things that interest me. Now I can learn from them, right? But that's not what interests me. So I always tell people, one, what do you want to accomplish? Be self-aware. Real estate's a dynamic industry. So you see me, I'm over here doing these raggedy houses. It looks fun, cute, sexy, but you may hate that. You may not even, you may be, should never buy an old raggedy house. You may need to go buy 10 or 20 or 30, 100 unit apartment because that suits you and what you're trying to accomplish. So the thing about real estate isn't mimicking what I do, what Patrick does, what Chris or whomever else does. It's figuring out, this is the way I ask it in a statement. I say, Patrick, what do you want real estate to do for you? Once you can figure out what you want real estate to do for you, then it's about how do you want to accomplish those things? And so that's one of the first things I tell people is, you know, you can learn from anyone, learn what to do, what not to do, how to do it better, faster, slower, more efficient, things of that nature. But you have to come to the table with something. You have to come with initiative. You have to come with a sense of direction. You have to come with a goal in mind that you want to get to. And then it's just about figuring out how real estate as an asset class can help you get to whatever that end goal or destination you're looking to get to. It doesn't seem like you're super money motivated by the whole real estate game. What is it that is like your mission, your drive? What is it that gets you up in the morning? I don't have money goals. None of my goals are attached to a dollar. Oh, I got to make this amount or that amount. To me, it's about living a fulfilled life for me. And so my thing is I want to impact my community, my city, my country in a positive manner. And one of my main ways of doing that is through real estate, design, development, and renovations. And so that's what excites me is knowing that I'm doing something that long after I'm gone will still be here. There will be buildings that we built that will be here, you know, 100 years from now. Houses that are already 100, 200 years old that we now just added another 100 years to their life. And there will be someone that will get to live in it. My son, my grandkids, my nieces, nephews, and whatnot will be, hey, my uncle did this or my dad did this. And so those things tend to mean a lot to me. And it's not necessarily what we do as much as it's how we do it and the people that we impact. And so part of why I do what I do and why I share is because I want to help more minorities get into real estate development. I want to help more women get into real estate development. I want more of our communities to going back to the gentrification topic. Gentrification isn't bad, but what's bad about gentrification inherently is none of the historical stakeholders or people in these areas are able to guide that get gentrification. So I want to create processes and pathways for people to have a little bit more control over what happens in their built in the built environment. And so those are some of the things that excite me about what I'm able to do or what I get to do. I'm fortunate enough to be able to wake up and do the things that we do. And I don't take it for granted at all. Yeah, you're doing good work in the world. And I love it. I love sharing like this today. I want to do a quick fire round if I could with you. Let's rock and roll. All right. You said you're a book nerd. Talk to me about a book that I should be reading right now. There's a book I read called Risk Game. It's a phenomenal book. Oh, Risk Game. Yeah, I think I've heard of this. Yeah, yeah. They, they were talking about it on Twitter, but uh, a while back. Yeah, Risk Game is a phenomenal book. It's a real estate book. It's a, like a real estate entrepreneur or no? No, it's a guy who's a um, venture capitalist wrote. It's a, kind of more of an autobiographical autobiography. But it's just written, he was very candid in, in how he wrote the book. And uh, it's just some wonderful stories. And there are a lot of different lessons that one can extrapolate from that book and apply into their lives. Yeah, I think like Moses or Levi Bankert or somebody mentioned that. So uh, it's on my, my list. So yeah, both. It's one, yeah, move it up to the top of the list. Trust me. Okay, I will do that. I will do that risk game. I'll put it in the show notes too. Who's your entrepreneurial or real estate hero? Man, I'm an entrepreneurial real estate hero. Now, that's one I hadn't been asked before. You kind of stumped me on that one. Let's come back to that one. Give me a second to marinate on that one, Patrick. Okay, okay. What about your worst job? Oh, gotcha. You know what? I'm going to tell you who my real estate entrepreneur hero. So when I was a mortgage broker, there's these two clients. This lady, I was, she was refinancing one of her properties because uh, there were some past due taxes. And I'll never forget asking her, I was like, what is your income? And she said, well, 25, baby. And I was like, 25, what? My month, a year, what are you saying? She didn't know, baby, $25,000 a month. And long story short, there was just this lady, uh, dad, as gave her and her love that she, he didn't give, her dad didn't give them gifts, regular gifts. He gave them houses. 
And by the time she was in her mid 40s, she had retired and her income was $300,000 a year from the assets that they own. I never forgot that lady. And then there's a gentleman, another person we were refinancing, and he drove an old Chevy Silverado trucker hat, Western t shirt with the marble uh, buttons on, pearl buttons. And, you know, I say, well, what do you do for a lease? He says, son, I'm retired. Where are you retired from? He says, all I do is cut the grass in my yards and pick up my rents. And, you know, just a regular old guy in a dr- old raggedy truck, but, but was rich as all get out, earned a, owned several million dollars, probably about two, three million dollars worth of real estate free and clear throughout some of the Houston neighborhoods. And just lived a really nice, cool, basic life, volunteered at his church, you know, was a pillar in his community. And so those were my real estate heroes because they were people that looked like me that served as an example of what. I could become if I had enough discipline, I added enough time, hard work into what it is I want to do. So those are my real estate heroes. I love stories like that. Yeah. And so you say, what was my worst job? Worst job. Yeah. Anything come to mind real quick? My worst job was working in this uh, plant for Texas Instruments, making like computer chips or something like that. Like it was, yeah, it was, it was horrible. I can't, were you like in a, those like white gowns and all that with the head? Yeah, like you had to wear these suits, these masks, and you know, it was, it was just a sterile environment. You couldn't really talk to people. Like, I'm a people person. I like to be out and about, you know, it was very it's regimented, you know, they timed how fast you got from here to there, so on and so forth. And, and ultimately I got fired from that job. So that's the other part about it that made it. That's awesome. I've got an uncle who says like the best job you can have is actually the worst one because it teaches you exactly what you don't want to be doing in life. And that's some good information to know about yourself. Siron, this has been a lot of fun. I've really enjoyed meeting you, talking with you, hearing about your stories and the Houston Vintage Homes. You are up to some good stuff in the world and really appreciate it. For our listeners that want to learn more about you, find out about what you're up to, what's the best way for them to do that? I highly recommend following, uh, checking us out on Twitter and Tyron McDaniel, the urban CEO on Twitter and on Instagram is Houston Vintage Homes. Okay. Thank you, man. I really appreciate your time today. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. They're irreplaceable. We say irreplaceable real estate is built by people who don't live anymore with methods we don't do anymore and materials we can't get anymore and entitlements we can't get them to approve anymore. That's irreplaceable. And we layer our giftings and, and programming over it, it's unbelievable. And think about this, even the, uh, even the insurance companies prove to us it's irreplaceable. Try to get something um, insured for actual replacement of what you have and you can't do it. 